Revolutionary Immortality, Mao Zedong and the Chinese Cultural Revolution, by Robert J. Lifton, Penguin Books, 1968. Preface. Books are responses to events. The unusual events in China from mid-1966 to early 1968 have led me to attempt a rather unusual kind of book. It is about Mao Zedong and the Cultural Revolution, but its larger concern is with men's efforts to render their works, and especially their revolutionary works, eternal. It is therefore a study of the vicissitudes of human continuity. The book evolves from a long-standing general interest in the contemporary interplay of psychology and history, as well as a specific interest in communist China's unique efforts at remaking men and women according to her ideological vision. My earlier study, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, explored these efforts as they extended into the late 1950s, including the Hundred Flowers episode of 1956 and 57 and its aftermath. During the early 1960s, my research interests turned to Japan, but I continued to follow events on the mainland as closely as I could. Once one has immersed oneself in matters Chinese, one never quite extricates oneself from them, nor does one wish to. Until about the beginning of 1966, although much of great interest continued to take place in China, I had the impression that events were generally consistent with the patterns of reform or rectification, followed by relative liberalization that I previously observed. During the late spring and early summer of 1966, however, this suddenly ceased to be true. Reports were confused, but they no, left no doubt that a movement of a very different order was developing. I found myself, like many others, puzzled and fascinated as I followed the Cultural Revolution from New Haven, New York, Cape Cod, and then London. My earlier work had provided many possible leads, but these seemed, if anything, to deepen the mystery. At that time, a new English edition of my book on thought reform was being scheduled, and the publisher's suggestion that I add a brief section on the Cultural Revolution seemed to me both sensible and problematic. Fortunately, I was soon to be on my way to the Far East for half a year of follow-up interviews with young Japanese, and in February 1967, I was able to arrange a brief stay in Hong Kong for the purpose of gaining a closer glimpse of mainland events. The Hong Kong re-exposure, I had done my original work there in 1954 and 55 and returned for shorter visits on two subsequent occasions, was invaluable. There, I could gather a great variety of extremely useful material and at the same time exchange impressions with a large number of China watchers who were thinking, talking about, and imbibing nothing but the Cultural Revolution. I could also converse at length with a few Westerners and Chinese who had recently come from the mainland, including one young man who had been actively involved in the Red Guard movement. I was thus able to obtain a feel of the Cultural Revolution, a sense of the extraordinary environment which had been created in China, and of the forces contributing to that environment. I became increasingly aware that the general psychological principles governing the thought reform process could not adequately illuminate the Cultural Revolution. Its agitated extremities of destruction and attempted revitalization demanded a larger perspective, one that could deal with man's struggles for various forms of renewal and transcendence. I had been thinking about such a perspective for some time in relationship to other work, partly from research in Hiroshima, but also from a continuing effort to formulate the nature of the individual experience in historical change, I had evolved a series of concepts around what I call modes of symbolic immortality. These deal with both death symbolism and human continuity, and in a work in progress, I had begun to apply them to different epochs and to a general view of the historical process. The approach is consistent with Otto Rank's emphasis upon man's continuing need for, quote, an assurance of eternal survival for his self, unquote. But while Rank saw this need as part of man's irrational nature, it seemed to me best understood as an aspect of his symbolic life, in which it in itself, which in of itself is neither rational nor irrational, but comprehensible within a formal and in the larger meaning of the word scientific framework. The sense of immortality, then, is the individual's connection with man's general past and future. 
I found the concept of symbolic immortality to be highly relevant to the issues of personal and historical continuity, and to related matters of ideological purity dominating the Cultural Revolution. What seemed indicated was a careful exploration in the light of this concept of forces at play in that movement. But this kind of exploration had to take on its own auto autonomy, had to become at the least, very least, a slim volume. In Tokyo during the spring of 1967, I worked with some excitement on the first draft of the manuscript. It was a good place to do so, for Japanese reporters and travelers were moving more freely among the participants in the Cultural Revolution, then still in full swing, than were their Western counterparts. They were also better able to read the wall posters, even if they occasionally made mistakes, and in their reports, as well as in our conversations, they conveyed, perhaps better than any other group, a vivid sense of the movement's evangelical enthusiasm and zealotry. Once I was back in the United States, I had opportunities to present the general argument of the book, first to a summer workshop devoted to psychohistorical problems, then to a Yale audience of faculty and students in Chinese studies. The responses evoked strength in my belief that this unconventional approach could have significance for a variety of people coming to the subject from very different vantage points. What has emerged is an interpretive essay whose central theme, that of revolutionary immortality, serves to organize a large number of divergent events and attitudes. I want to stress that this is by no means the only theme one could have chosen for such a purpose. One could have instead emphasized the economic strains of a developing country, China's confrontation with America, the Sino-Soviet dispute, or the inevitable conflicts arising in the history of any revolution. Large historical events cannot be attributed to a single cause, nor grasped by a single explanation. Neither is mine the only possible psychological approach. One could have stressed, for instance, Mao's individual psychological development in more usual psychoanalytical terms, with emphasis on the monumental conflict with his father, which all accounts suggest. Indeed, a full-scale psychobiography of Mao will surely be undertaken sometime in the future, but that is not my intention here. Rather, I focus upon certain features of Mao's psychological and revolutionary style, as these have come to bear upon a series of personal and historical exigencies of his and China's situation. Such a focus is part of a continuing effort to find new conceptual connections between individual and collective patterns especially under extreme historical conditions. What I would claim for the use of the theme of symbolic immortality is a particular pertinence to this kind of extreme episode and a general inclusiveness permitting the alternative themes mentioned earlier to be taken into account. It enables me, for instance, to explore, in what I believe to be a new way, an excruciatingly complex encounter between man and technology. While rejecting the simple polarity of rational versus irrational behavior, I have found it necessary here to make certain psychological judgments concerning attitudes and behavior as they relate to the potentialities of the environment. One example is the concept of psychism, the exaggerated reliance upon will and psychic power to achieve technological goals. But I apply the concept only where there have been strong indications of this tendency, as confirmed by peculiarly self-defeating results. The evidence I cite does not derive from the kind of systematic series of interviews I have done in connection with previous work. I did conduct a number of interviews, and I found them extremely informative. But I also depend upon observations at a distance, upon writings and reported actions of Mao and others, and I do not hesitate to speculate about the relationship of these to the general themes I develop. I do, however, attempt to discipline this speculation, both by seeking converging evidence from several directions, and by making explicit the steps of my psychological argument. Above all, I stress shared experience, and avoid resorting to what I regard as a solipsistic tendency all too common in my own profession, that of viewing large historical events as nothing but manifestations of someone's individual psychopathology. I have, in fact, become newly impressed by the potential usefulness of a category of data falling somewhere between group ideology and individual psychological style, a level of experience that has been largely ignored, but which, I believe, will take on considerable future importance for both psychologists and historians. I confine myself to the Chinese Cultural Revolution, preferring to leave farther-ranging theoretical explorations for another study. But, as my title implies, I see the Chinese situation as a paradigm for revolutions in general. 
Hence, I believe that the experience of the Soviet Union could be profitably re-examined in relationship to the theme of revolutionary immortality, focusing upon the early expression of the Marxist-Leninist vision, and viewing subsequent developments under Stalin, Khrushchev, and the present regime as embodying simultaneous attempts to eternalize and alter that vision. One could bring a similar approach to the French Revolution, and to a number of other partial or even failed revolutions. Not that all these events are the same. Indeed, the framework I suggest might shed some light on why one revolution aborts at its inception, another changes the world, and a third succeeds and then consumes itself. To generalize in this way does not preclude, and in fact requires, a stress upon what is peculiarly Chinese. Only from an emphasis upon cultural roots and historical context can one derive the stuff of generalization. An upheaval like the Cultural Revolution, demonstrates the all too forcibly the need to view Chinese behavior neither as identical in motivation and nuance with Western behavior, nor as a self-enclosed form of Oriental exoticism. To see Chinese experience as both distinctive and part of the general flow of human events would seem a simple enough principle, but it has been long in coming into practice. China differentiates herself from the West by means of her specific combination of cultural symbols evolved over the course of her history. But these symbols depend upon psychobiological potential available to all men in all epochs. They are, moreover, subject to the increasingly shared currents of world history. Finally, I hope that this essay speaks to certain contemporary issues quite beyond China's struggles or even general questions of revolution. I refer to dilemmas of historical discontinuity to the broken connection or impaired sense of immortality that now affect people in every society. By gaining some understanding of China's resulting combination of desperation and excess, we may better learn to live not only with her, but with ourselves as well. My hope, in fact, is that this study of a closed and totalistic revolutionary vision will serve to strengthen the more humane and searching forms of radical thought now struggling to take shape throughout the world, especially among the young. New Haven, Connecticut, March 1968. Revolutionary Immortality, Mao Zedong and the Chinese Cultural Revolution by Robert J. Lifton, 1968, Chapter 1. The Power Struggle, an Approach. We do well to recognize our ignorance of China. That ignorance has been perpetuated by two decades of virtual absence of either diplomatic or journalistic contact between the United States and China. A situation which, in the not-too-distant future, will surely be regarded as a historical oddity of the mid-20th century. Moreover, even those Westerners and other non-Chinese who have been permitted extensive residence on the mainland have rarely had an opportunity to observe closely the actual states of mind of individual Chinese, nor has the regime been interested in revealing much more than its own ideal image of what that state of mind should be. It is nonetheless possible that we have become too accustomed to a stance of ignorance. For a good deal of significant information had been reaching us, from people coming out of China, from the official press and radio, and from a great variety of semi-official and unofficial writings and speeches, including the celebrated great character posters of the Cultural Revolution, as recorded by an international coterie of China watchers, many of them very well informed, whose numbers ever increase. Could it be, then, that our ignorance has to do not so much with facts alone as with an inability to make sense of the vast amount of information we do possess? What I am suggesting is that a good part of our ignorance is conceptual. Indeed, how is one to make sense of the extraordinary events that occurred in 1966 and 1967 as part of the great proletarian cultural revolution? How is one to understand the dramatic emergence of militant new groups such as the Red Guards and the revolutionary rebels, who at times seemed all-powerful as they pursued their campaigns of purification and vilification? The unprecedented and undiplomatic verbal and physical abuse accorded to British, French, Russian, Indian, Burmese, and other foreign diplomats? And the still more startling attacks upon party members, along with general undermining of party authority, including periods of violence and confusion of such magnitude as to suggest complete national chaos and even civil war? The explanation usually put forth is that there has been a power struggle, or, following for a few complexities, essentially a power struggle. The implication is that this designation, accompanied by a few comments about political rivalries, explains all. 
during a visit to Hong Kong in February 1967, I found many Western and Chinese observers, rivaling in agitation the participants in the Cultural Revolution itself, putting forth endless and endlessly elaborate speculations on how Liu Xiaoqi or Lin Biao or Zhou Enlai really felt about Mao Zedong, or, when these were exhausted, how their wives really felt about one another. Such speculations, when offered as a total explanation for the Cultural Revolution, were consistent with certain cultural tendencies affecting the observers. The Chinese inclination to see the world as no more than a network of human relationships and rivalries, and the American preoccupation with what might be called practical mechanisms, rather than ideological or theoretical considerations. Note, the American stress upon mechanism and the Chinese emphasis upon human relationships are themselves ideological. Both can be thought of as anti-ideological ideologies. Without denying the psychological importance of personal rivalries, the great shortening, shortcoming of the individual power struggle theories was their failure to place such struggles and rivalries within a larger psychological and historical framework. They thus contained a number of implicit but unexplained and highly dubious assumptions about power and rivalry as ultimate human motivations. A related kind of explanation focused upon the state of Mao's physical and mental health as the key to everything taking place. And in Hong Kong in particular, one encountered articulate, even passionate defenders of the points of view that Mao is in excellent health, severely ill, senile, mad, or dead. Here too we may say that Mao's physical and mental health is an important question, but that its use as the explanation of the Cultural Revolution is an effort to take refuge from complexity by means of an individual diagnosis. During these early weeks, those early weeks of 1967, all news from the mainland was seized upon by Hong Kong China watchers, but the adherence of the power struggle and individual diagnostic theories, both often held by the same people, seemed to be expecting, or at least hoping for, that specific news item would, once and for all, supply the missing piece to the puzzle that lay bare the power struggle or establish the diagnosis. But there have also been, in Hong Kong and elsewhere throughout the world, much more thoughtful approaches to an understanding of the Cultural Revolution. These have stressed such factors as China's, and especially Mao's, Yan'an Syndrome, or Yan'an Complex, the nostalgia for the heroic revolutionary methods and achievements of days gone by, China's abrupt loss of a comfortable relationship to her own cultural past, her sense of mounting threat from the outside, especially from America's intervention in Vietnam, and her undergoing a kind of Protestant-Catholic dispute between evangelical reawakening and established bureaucratic compromise. Footnote 1. Benjamin Schwartz, Upheaval in China, Commentary 1967, emphasizes Mao's nostalgic idealization of the idyllic days of Yan'an, as does Mark Gein in Foreign Affairs, January 1967, who, to the best of my knowledge, first used the terms Yan'an Syndrome and Yan'an Complex. Franz Skurman, in New York Review, October 1966 and 67, January 1967, speaks of Mao's anticipation, on the basis of American escalation of the Vietnam War, of an impending moment of confrontation with America. Joseph Levinson, in New York Review, January 1967, describes a conviction of present crisis, which renders, quote, the pastness of the past not so certain, because the future is so uncertain, unquote. And Martin Bernal, in Puritanism Chinese Style, New York Review, October 1967, sees the Cultural Revolution as, quote, a temporary break between the two forces that have created the culture, Chinese Revolution, Catholic and Protestant organization and inspiration, unquote. These writings are consistent with different aspects of the point of view I shall set forth, as is Roderick McFarquhar's Mao's Last Revolution, Foreign Affairs, October 1966, although only Skurman's and Levinson's articles were available to me when I originally prepared my manuscript. See also writings by Father L. Ladani, Mao's China, the Decline of a Dynasty in Foreign Affairs, July 1967, and Continuing Commentary in China News Analysis, which Father Delaney edits from Hong Kong, Jean T. Xiao in Asian Survey, H.C. Kuang, Berkeley Studies in Chinese Communist Terminology and Michael Oxenberg, Asian Survey, and Robert Elegant in Foreign Affairs. When this book was in press, I came upon Goldner and Horowitz's The Red Guard in Transaction, November 1966, whose sociological interpretation is similar to my own psychohistorical one. I also made extensive use of translations and summaries of Chinese Communist newspapers and periodicals and of the great character posters of Red Guards and other groups.
the latter, which were especially prominent during the early days of the Cultural Revolution as daily commentaries, which were unofficial but significant, on directions of thought and action, appeared at various focal points in the large cities. They were consistent with the use of wall newspapers in earlier Chinese Communist campaigns. Translation appeared in Survey of China Mainland Press and Selections from China Mainland Magazine, both published by the U.S. Consulate General in Hong Kong in China News Analysis, and newspaper articles in the New York Times, the Times, and the London Observer, and the Manchester Guardian. I also availed myself of the extensive coverage in the Japanese press and of the various Eastern and Western European commentaries appearing in American, British, and Japanese publications. Direct quotations of Chinese writings, unless otherwise identified, come from one of those sources. Also very useful were a number of commentaries appearing in Current Scene, published by the U.S. Consulate General in Hong Kong, in the China Quarterly, published in London, and Asian Survey, published in Berkeley. All of these interpretations contain considerable truth. And the first, in particular, illuminates what has been much of what has been occurring, that being Yan'an syndrome or a Yan'an complex, a nostalgia for the heroic revolutionary methods and achievements of days gone by. But we have lacked a general perspective within which to comprehend both psychological motives and historical context, that is, a psychohistorical framework. I propose such a framework, however tentative and precarious, because I believe it can reveal much about motivations behind and relationships between seemingly unfathomable and disjointed events, and at the same time possibly contribute to the general understanding of such upheavals, wherever they may occur. My goal is not to reduce the vast canvas of the Cultural Revolution to a set of individual psychological observations. Rather, I wish to suggest a theoretical perspective which, while unitary, is also open and broadly inclusive, and which stresses shifting symbols and forms in the interplay of the individual with the collective. The approach, then, as I have elsewhere indicated, is most accurately termed that of psychoformation. I should like to suggest that much of what has been taking place in China recently can be understood as a quest for revolutionary immortality. By revolutionary immortality, I mean a shared sense of participating in permanent revolutionary fermentation and of transcending individual death by living on indefinitely within this continuing revolution. Some such vision has been present in all revolutions and was directly expressed in Trotsky's ideological principle of permanent revolution, even if other things were also meant by this term, but it has taken on unprecedented intensity in present-day Chinese communist experience. Central to this point of view is the concept of symbolic immortality I've described in earlier work, of man's need, in the face of inevitable biological death, to maintain an inner sense of continuity with what has gone on before and what will go on after his own individual existence. From this point of view, the sense of immortality is much more than a mere denial of death, it is part of compelling, life-enhancing imagery, binding each individual person to significant groups and events removed from him in time and place. It is the individual's inner perception of his involvement in what we call the historical process. The sense of immortality may be expressed biologically, by living on through or in one's sons and daughters, and their sons and daughters, theologically, in the idea of a life after death or of other forms of spiritual conquest of death, creatively or through works and influences persisting beyond biological death, through identification with nature and with its infinite extension into time and space, or experimentally through a feeling state, that of experiential transcendence, so intense that, at least temporarily, it eliminates time and death. While this may at first seem a rather abstract approach to the passions and actions of old revolutionaries and young followers, I believe that only by recognizing such life and death components of the revolutionary psyche can we begin to comprehend precisely these passions and actions. Footnote 2. See my Death in Life Survivors of Hiroshima, New York, Random House, 1968, an article in Psychiatry, 1964, entitled On Death and Death Symbolism, the Hiroshima Disaster. In a forthcoming study entitled The Broken Connection, I elaborate on the theory of symbolic immortality and apply it to a variety of individual and historical situations. Applying these modes of symbolic immortality to the revolutionary, we may say that he becomes part of a vast family, reaching back to what he perceives to be the historical beginnings of his revolution and extending infinitely into the future. This socially created family tends to replace the biological one as a mode of immortality. Moreover, it can itself take on an increasingly biological quality, as over the generations, revolutionary identifications become blended with national, cultural, and racial ones. 
The revolutionary denies theology as such, but embraces a secular utopia through images closer related to the spiritual conquest of death and even to an afterlife. His revolutionary works are all important, and only to the extent that he can perceive them as enduring can he achieve a measure of acceptance of his own eventual death. The natural world to which he allies himself is one that must be transformed by revolution, while continuing to contain all that revolution creates. And his experiential transcendence can approach that of religious mystics, as a glance at some of the younger participants in China's cultural revolution confirms. What all this suggests, then, is that the essence of the power struggle taking place in China, as of all such power struggles, is power over death. Revolutionary Immortality, Mao Zedong and the Chinese Cultural Revolution, by Robert J. Lifton, 1968, Chapter 2, The Death of the Leader. Central to China's recent crisis, I believe, is a form of anxiety related to both the anticipated death of a great leader and the death of the revolution he has so long dominated. This death anxiety is shared by leader and followers alike, but we do best to focus for a time upon the former. It is impossible to know Mao's exact physical or mental state, but let us assume, on the basis of evidence we have, that the 74-year-old, born on 26 December 1893, man, has generally been vigorous, that he has experienced rather severe illness in recent years, and that he has always been a man of strong revolutionary passions. We can go a bit further, however, especially on the basis of a valuable interview with him conducted by Edgar Snow, perhaps the American who over the years has been closest to Mao, in January 1965. Footnote, the interview was held on the 9th of January 1965. See Edgar Snow, Interview with Mao, published in the New Republic, 27th February 1965. Snow found Mao alert, wholly relaxed, and impressive in his stamina during their four-hour meeting. Snow also states, One of the chairman's doctors informed me that Mao has no organic troubles and suffers from nothing beyond the normal fatigue of his age, unquote, and points out that an interview of that kind, coming as it did at the end of strenuous weeks devoted to the National People's Congress, might have been more speedily terminated by a sick man. But he describes watching Mao after seeing Snow to his car brace his shoulders and slowly retrace his steps, leaning heavily on the arm of an aide, writes Snow. Subsequent observations on his health differ, but they suggest that from 1965 until 1967 he was neither completely well nor totally incapacitated. The infrequency of his public appearances and his even rarer public speeches, together with a certain amount of observed bodily rigidity, have led to speculation that he might be suffering from some kind of arteriosclerotic condition, or possibly a form of paralysis agitans, Parkinson's disease. Such conditions could affect the mental state, both through organic damage and compensatory efforts to deny incapacity, with related changes in symbolic organization of thought. But if dysfunction were present, it would probably take the form of exaggeration or even caricature of prior psychological tendencies, rather than the sudden appearance of totally new ones. <clears throat> Snow found Mao alert, wholly relaxed and impressive in his stamina during their four-hour meeting. He also found him, quote, reflecting on man's rendezvous with death and ready to leave the assessment of his political legacy to future generations, unquote. Indeed, Snow's general description of the interview suggests a man anticipating, if not preoccupied with, death. Snow reports Mao to have said that, quote, he was going to see God, unquote. Snow presents Mao's statements in close third-person paraphrase rather than direct quotation, in accordance with an agreement he made with Mao's aides. He was able to check his own recollections with a record written uh, by one of the Chinese who had been present. And when Snow responded to Mao's statement that he was going to see God, by reassuring Mao that he seemed to be in good condition that evening, Mao Zedong smiled wryly and expressed some doubt, again saying that he was, quote, getting ready to see God very soon, unquote. We need not dwell on Mao's rather striking use of the theological idiom 
other than attributing it to a combination of playfulness and perhaps an unconscious inclination on the part of a man who early in his life had renounced rural supernatural beliefs in favor of Marxist scientific ones, to hedge his bets a little. When Snow questioned him on the matter, he denied any belief in a deity, but observed rather whimsically that, quote, some people who claimed to be well informed said there was a god. There seemed to be many gods, and sometimes the same god, when called forth for self-serving political purposes, could take all sides, quote. More importantly from our standpoint are the reminiscences that immediately follow about family members who had died, about his career as a revolutionary, and about, quote, the chance combination of reasons, unquote, that had caused him to become interested in the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. Involved here is an old man's nostalgic need to review his past life in relationship to his forthcoming death. That is, death is seen as the test of the quality of one's overall existence. And in the face of a threat of total extinction, one feels the need to give form to that existence, to formulate its basic connectedness, its movement or development, and above all, its symbolic integrity or cohesion and significance. Prominent among these reminiscences is Mao's sense of being an eternal survivor, his recollections of both his brothers having been killed, of the execution of his first wife during the revolution, and the death of their son during the Korean War. Mao commented that it was odd that he had escaped death, and that although he was often prepared for it, quote, death did not, just did not want, seem to want him, unquote. Death just did not seem to want him. He described several narrow escapes from which he emerged unscathed, including one in which he was, quote, splashed all over with the blood of another soldier, unquote. Mao seems to be telling us that his death is both imminent and long overdue. What he considers remarkable is not that so many family members and revolutionary comrades, the two categories become virtually inseparable, have died around him, but that he has in each case been spared. We recognize the survivor's characteristically guilt-laden need to contrast his own continuing life with others' deaths. Footnote, there is a suggestion here also of the survivor's sense of reinforced invulnerability, of having met death and, by means of a special destiny, conquered it. It is this sense that permits the survivor to enter into the myth of the hero, as we shall see to be the case with Mao. But I have found that such feelings can be fragile and can readily reverse themselves to expose a heightened sense of vulnerability exposed beneath. For Mao is surely the survivor par excellence, the hero of a truly epic story of revolutionary survival, that of the Long March of 1934 and 35, in which it is believed that more than 80% of the original group perished along a 6,000-mile trek in order that the remainder and the revolution itself might stay alive. To transcend his guilt, the survivor must be able to render significant the death immersions he has experienced, and in Mao's case, done much to bring about. This kind of survivor formulations faces both ways, justification of the past and contribution to the future. Thus, for a Mao, man in Mao's position of his age and special commitments, the affirmation of a life of immortality becomes crucial. The overwhelming threat is not so much death itself as the suggestion that his revolutionary works will not endure. We sense the passion behind his apparent calm as he goes on during the same interview to describe the two possibilities for the future. The first, the, quote, continued development of the revolution toward communism, unquote, and the second, quote, that youth could negate the revolution and give a poor performance, make peace with imperialism, bring back the remnants of Chiang Kai-shek clique to the mainland, and take a stand beside the small percentage of counter-revolutionaries still in the country." Unquote. The first is an image of continuous life, the second of death and extinction, of impaired immortality. What he said next, quote, of course he did not hope for counter-revolution, but future events would be decided by future generations. Unquote is unexpectedly stark in its suggestion of negative possibility. He is, in other words, far from certain about the fate of his revolutionary works, about the vindication of his own life. Revolutionary Immortality, Mao Zedong and the Chinese Cultural Revolution by Robert J. Lifton, 1968. 
Chapter 3. The Death of the Revolution Mao's ultimate dread, the image of extinction that stalks him, is the death of the revolution. When he speaks of the possible poor performance of the young, his overriding concern is that the immortal revolutionary legacy will be squandered. As he pointed out to Edgar Snow in that same interview, quote, those in China now, under the age of 20, have never fought a war and never seen an imperialist or known capitalism in power, unquote. His fear is not simply that the young are too soft, but that they may be incapable of sharing and perpetuating the worldview that created the revolution. For that worldview was based upon his and his generation's specific experience, as he, and as he goes on to say about the young, quote, they knew nothing about the old society at first hand. Parents could tell them, but to hear about history and to read books was not the same thing as living it, unquote. That is, in such unknowing hands, the sacred thing itself, the revolution, could be abused, neglected, permitted to die. Such historical death can, for the revolutionary, represent an end of the world, an ultimate deformation and desymbolization. Footnote, all of these terms refer to symbolic death, through loss of viable relationship to the forms and symbols which sustain psychic life. It may cause anxiety similar to, or even greater than, that associated with the idea of individual death. Actually, the two forms of death anxiety become inseparable. If the revolution is to be extinguished, the dying revolutionary can envision nothing but the total extinction of his own self. Maoists repeatedly call forth certain specific images to suggest the danger of the death of the revolution. These include American imperialism, feudalism, the capitalist road, bourgeois remnants, and modern revisionism. American imperialism is the ultimate enemy to which one must be alert, lest it destroy the revolution through power or guile. But the threat it poses is external, and therefore largely visible. Feudal or capitalist and bourgeois remnants, on the other hand, are doubly dangerous, because, as retained internal poisons, whose effects are mainly upon the mind, they tend to be invisible. They thus require constant psychic purging, as provided by the extensive programs of thought reform or brainwashing, so long prominent in Chinese communist practice. But what has recently emerged as the greatest threat of all is modern revisionism, for it is both an external danger, as embodied by a visible friend turned enemy, the Soviet Union, and an internal one of an insidious personal nature. It is a form of degeneracy or inner death experienced by those who once knew the true path to revolutionary immortality, but, through a combination of moral weakness and shadowy conspiracy, strayed from it. Much more than the other negative images, modern revisionism looms as almost an immediate possibility. Footnote, the kind of energy the Chinese communists have long mobilized against feudal remnants, influences from the old society believed to threaten China's future, now seem to be directed against modern revisionism. The shift in emphasis has great historical significance, but the quality of urgency and danger is psychologically consistent in the two cases. But why now? Why the current crisis in revolutionary immortality? There is much evidence that the Cultural Revolution represents the culmination of a series of conflicts surrounding totalistic visions and national campaigns of an increasing inability to fulfill the visions or achieve the transformations of this physical and spiritual environment claimed by the campaigns. The conflicts took on great intensity over the debate, including the late 1950s and early 1960s, and found their quintessential expression in what was surely the most remarkable campaign of all prior to the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward of 1958. I shall later examine more closely the cast of mind associated with the Great Leap and the technological and psychological impediments involved. It was a heroic attempt to achieve rapid industrialization and collectivization by making extensive use of the bare hands and pure minds of the Chinese people. Its massive failures resulted in overwhelming death imagery in several ways. It produced widespread confusion and suffering even as the regime was announcing its brilliant achievements. And its extensive falsification of statistics reached down it was later learned, to virtually every level of party cadre. This falsification represented something more than merely a conscious attempt on the part of the regime to deceive the outside world. It was an expression of a powerful need, dictated by pressures from above, but by no means limited to government leaders, 
to maintain a collective image of revolutionary vitality that became, so to speak, more real than reality itself. Such visions of transformation had become so basic to Chinese communist, and more specifically Maoist, practice, and in many cases had been so brilliantly realized, that they could not be abandoned without a sense that the fundamental momentum of the revolution, its life force, was ebbing. When the disparity between vision and experience became manifest, we suspect earlier confidence in China's revolutionary immortality must have been severely undermined, even among those closest to Mao, who had in the past shared most enthusiastically in his vision. Whether one attributed the Great Leap's failure to insufficient revolutionary zeal, as Mao did, or to an excess of the same, as did Liu Xiaoqi and other pragmatists, all came to feel anxious about the life of the revolution. The regime's subsequent economic backtracking and cultural liberalization in 1961 and 1962, apparently implemented by the pragmatists despite Maoist resistance, also contributed to these conflicts. Measures deemed necessary for a national recovery encouraged precisely the kinds of personal freedom and self-interest readily viewed within Chinese communist ideology as decadent individualism and economism. That is, liberalization posed a severe threat to the totalistic vision of absolute subjugation of self to regime, upon which the overall claim to revolutionary immortality had been built. The same pattern had occurred before, following the Hundred Flowers episode of 1956 and 57, an even more celebrated program of relaxation strongly influenced by Khrushchev's revelations about Stalin, by the Hungarian uprising, and by economic difficulties in China itself. At that time, the Chinese shared in the general shattering of the image of infallibility surrounding the Soviet Union as the center of world communism, and this must also have raised questions about their own mode of revolutionary immortality. The liberalization of 1961 and 62, following several years of economic strain and general unrest caused by the failure of the Great Leap, did not produce quite the luxuriant across-the-board condemnation of the regime that took place at the time of the Hundred Flowers but there was, nevertheless, a muted historical repetition. More important, precisely the things said by many intellectuals during 1961 and 62, the demand for de-emphasis of politics and for stress upon learning for its own sake, including greater use of books and equipment from capitalist countries, and especially the mockery of the regime's claim to infallibility, came to be denounced later as signs of degeneracy and decay. The very fruits of liberalization became, for Mao and certain other Chinese leaders, death-tainted threats to the immortal revolutionary vision. From 1962 onward, and especially since 1965, when the preliminaries to the Cultural Revolution took place, the regime has been struggling to reassert the confident relationship to history it had possessed in earlier days. The split among party leaders has had much to do with the image held of just how one should go about doing this. During the pre-Cultural Revolution decade, Mao encountered increasing opposition because of his long commitment to the kind of heroic but unrealizable vision that reached its zenith in the Great Leap Forward. From at least 1955, the pragmatists, and one must always look upon this term as relative, within the party, have sought to moderate this vision and to pursue programs resembling the less militant Soviet example. They apparently succeeded in curbing Mao's influence, at least temporarily, during the late 1950s and early 1960s. This resistance to Mao, leading to his resignation under pressure from the state chairmanship in December 1958, though he did retain chairmanship of the party throughout, could take shape only because of the growing conviction that alternatives to his policies were absolutely necessary for economic and social stability. But Mao was later to refer scornfully to such pragmatists as women with bound feet, and to associate their caution with remnants of the dying old regime. To Mao and his supporters, both his partial ouster and the programmatic alternatives of his opponents were expressions of betrayal of the revolutionary vision, evidences of death and deterioration. Footnote. Peking wall posters reported Mao to have said in October 1966, I was extremely discontented with that decision, but I could do nothing about it. And Xiao, without relying on the accuracy of the wall posters, concludes that, quote, the existing evidence suggests that Mao gave up his state chairmanship, not entirely by his own choice. But there are some observers who, stressing the importance of doctrine for the Chinese communists, accept the official version given out at the time of the decision, which was the 10th of December 1958, namely that Mao was being relieved of his duties as state chairman in order to, quote, make it possible for him to spare more of his time to do the theoretical work of Marxism-Leninism. 
Maoists later called forth the picturesque idiom of Chinese folklore to place these critics in the center of a demonology, the pragmatists, referring to them as demons, devils, monsters, ogres, ghosts, and freaks. But demonology always addresses itself to the management of life and death and includes an implicit theory of what might be called negative immortality incarnations of evil which never die out, whatever one does to counter their nefarious influences. Groups like the Maoists, who so boldly defy human limitation, are inevitably plagued in turn by images of supernatural enemies, for demonology also reflects unacceptable subterranean conflicts. The devils and monsters under attack are largely inner doubts of Maoist accusers concerning their own omnipotence. They are, in effect, anti-immortals. What are some of these deadly influences? Much of the rhetoric during the Cultural Revolution and the socialist education movement preceding it has been a reaction and an answer to ideas expressed during the preceding year of liberalization from 1961 to 62. Under attack at the philosophical level have been theories of human nature, along with expressions of humanism or even socialist humanism, making their way to China from Russian and Eastern European intellectual circles. For such concepts deny that class origin is the ultimate moral and psychological determinant of behavior, the first by insisting that certain characteristics are shared by all of mankind, and the second through a principle the Chinese contemptuously term love for all people, under which even capitalists and landlords become worthy of sympathy. Ideas like these are dangerous because they could undermine the Maoist vision of revolutionary immortality by encouraging people to revert to alternative intellectual traditions which extol quests for truth and self-realization. Or, in the somewhat more pejorative language of the Cultural Revolution, they lead to desires, quote, to get on by politics, to be really good at your specialty, and have a good life, quote. These ideas emerge from post-Stalinist thought from modern revisionism and express a rediscovery of the individual. But in Chinese media, they are dismissed as philosophy of survival. Paradoxically, a humanist principle of love for all people becomes associated in Maoist terminology with degeneration into a petrifying bourgeoisie, with traits that deserve to be relegated to the morgue. Humanist principles extolling man's life are now seen as agents of death, as demons that must be exercised, lest their deadly emanations destroy all. The Chinese have also had to cope with a more concrete form of death anxiety, as stimulated by the war in Vietnam and the fear of war with America. There is good evidence that the repeated characterization of America as a paper tiger by no means eliminates in Chinese minds images of annihilation associated with her destructive power. And Mao has, in the past, regularly instituted large-scale programs of reform and rectification when preparing for actual military combat, but I believe that the fear of war with America is in itself less of a fundamental source of the Cultural Revolution than an aggravating factor in the overall death anxiety surrounding it. And the Cultural Revolution itself appears to be more a quest for a collective sense of revolutionary power than an actual mobilization of military power to combat an outside enemy. China's crisis, then, involves a profound general threat to revolutionary immortality intertwined with the... Revolutionary Immortality, Mao Zedong and the Chinese Cultural Revolution by Robert J. Lifton, 1968 Chapter 4, The Quest for Rebirth The activist response to symbolic death, or to what might be called unmastered death anxiety, is a quest for rebirth. One could, in fact, view the entire cultural revolution as a demand for renewal of communist life. It is, in other words, a call for reassertion of revolutionary immortality. Without losing sight of antagonisms among individual leaders, we do well to consider the significance of the cultural in this unique revolution. We may speak of culture in its broadest anthropological, anthropological sense, as an accumulation of significant symbols, or, as Clifford Gertz has recently written, of symbolic sources of illumination, which each man requires to put a construction upon events to orient himself to the ongoing course of experienced things. These are quotes from Clifford Gertz, The Impact of the Concept of Culture on the Concept of Man, published in Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, 
April 1966. Mao seems to have a similarly inclusive view of human culture, but unlike Western anthropologists, he feels compelled to regulate its tone and content, at least within his nation, and to take steps to alter it radically when it seems to be moving in undesirable directions. Footnote. The idea that the state and its officials should manage the cultural tone of society, should supervise the songs people sing, the rituals they follow, the principles by which they live, goes far back in Chinese tradition. It is an aspect of the holistic view of man in his relationship to state, society, and nature that persists in communist practice. A cultural revolution anywhere involves a collective shift in the psychic images around which life is organized. In Maoist China, however, it has meant nothing less than an all-consuming death and birth experience, an induced catastrophe, together with a prescription for reconstituting the world being destroyed. The total mobilization of faith in Mark Gein's phrase, involved in this prescription for rebirth, has been peculiarly autistic. For more than a year, the Chinese turned in upon themselves, performing actions required by their inner states or those of their leaders, however inappropriate or repugnant these actions may have seemed to a perplexed and fascinated outside world. In this sense, the Cultural Revolution moves in the direction of what I propose to call psychism, the attempt to achieve control over one's external environment through internal or psychological manipulations, through behavior determined by intra-psychic needs no longer in touch with the actualities of the world one seeks to influence. Footnote. Psychism is an admittedly awkward coinage, but it seems the best term for the phenomenon I wish to describe. Other related words, such as autism, psychologism, and voluntarism, have specific meanings and would be misleading. The concept is relative, and to say that the Cultural Revolution moves in the direction of psychism is by no means to claim that everything its leaders and followers do or say fits into this category. I shall have much to say about such psychism as a predominant element in the Cultural Revolution's Maoist call to life. The agents of this attempted rebirth, the Red Guards, reveal much about its nature. The tenderness of their years. They have included not only youths in their early twenties or late teens, but children of thirteen and fourteen, has been striking to everyone and then much too quickly attributed to political necessity alone. The assumption here is that, having alienated most of the more mature population by his extreme policies, Mao had no choice but to call upon the young. But I believe that one must look beyond such explanations, whatever their partial truth, to the wider symbolism of the Red Guard movement. According to most accounts, the Red Guards first began to appear during the early summer of 1966. One Red Guard poster put up at Tsinghua University Middle School, later named Red Guard Militant School, was dated 24th June, and there are other versions that claim an even earlier appearance at Peking or Beijing University. Their exact origin remains obscure. One model referred to by the Chinese press is that of a group of guerrilla units during the heroic early days of the Chinese Revolution, which bore the same name and were also often very young. Needless to say, there is no reference to the Red Guards of the Russian Revolution, though these were probably the original inspiration for the concept. What is certain is that the present-day People's Liberation Army has served as an important model for the emergence of the new Red Guard of China's Cultural Revolution. Only after an official public confirmation and blessing from Mao Zedong during a gigantic dawn rally on 18th of August 1966 did the Red Guard take on national and international significance. Within a few days, tens of thousands of youngsters with identifying red armbands were roaming through Beijing, and before long, the entire country. 
Some have viewed the Red Guard movement as a spontaneous phenomenon, a point of view encouraged by the regime itself. Most Western observers take the opposite position and see it as carefully shaped throughout by knowing Maoist sculptures. What appears to have taken place is a combination of purposeful manipulation by Maoists and partly autonomous responses and decisions by leaders of Red Guard units, with all behavior profoundly influenced by the immortalizing vision animating the Cultural Revolution. Permitting a certain amount of spontaneity in this kind of movement would be in keeping with Maoist concepts of the revolutionary creativity of the masses, though such concepts would by no means preclude close control over the extent and direction of that spontaneity. The Maoists certainly were in general control of the Red Guard movement during its early months, much less so during the factional rivalries and general confusion later on. But from the beginning, there was probably a good deal of emotion stimulated that went its own way and could not be entirely managed by anyone, as is generally true of mass movements, especially when participants are very young. It is possible the Red Guard as some have already claimed, could turn out to be a transitional entity, to be dispensed with as soon as it has outlived its usefulness. Even if this is the case, however, one must consider the meaning of the creation of a youth force at this time, and the specific functions it was called upon to serve. From the beginning, the battle cry was the triumph of youth over age, of the new over the old. Hence, the Red Guards announced early goal of totally destroying the four olds, old ideas, old culture, old customs, and old habits, and the similar stress upon smashing the old educational system in its entirety. The formation of the Red Guard was, in fact, closely tied in with an attack upon teachers, university officials, and educational policies beginning at Beijing University in May and June 1966. This focus upon education has been part of an effort to bring about a shift in qualities of mind that are to be esteemed and rewarded. More important than newness as such, past revolutionary virtues were honored, has been an association with the youth and vitality. And the human targets selected by the young militants for mental and physical abuse were, in contrast, referred to as old fogies of the landlord and bourgeois class, the revisionist clique of old men on the Beijing Party Committee, and a bit later as old men in authority and old gentlemen who follow the capitalist road. The Red Guards themselves were heralded as young people who had declared war on the old world, but in their attack upon old age and decay, they were, psychologically speaking, declaring war upon death itself. The special aura of the Red Guard had to do not only with its youth, but with its class purity. Its members were presented to the general public as an elite organization of youngsters, charged with cleansing the entire nation. One could be admitted to their number, at least during those early days, only if one came from a family of workers, of poor or middle peasants, of revolutionary cadres, or of members of the People's Liberation Army. With the rapid expansion of the Red Guard into a mass movement, these standards were inevitably relaxed, but its purity was nonetheless constantly contrasted with the five black categories of people selected for attack. Landlords, rich peasants, counter-revolutionaries, bad elements, and rightists. Footnote, bad elements a rather loosely used term, which in earlier campaigns has referred to various undesirable local types, including those who have connections with the underworld or with remnants of secret societies prominent in traditional and pre-communist China, and those who do not engage in productive work. From this standpoint, the 18th August rally launching the Red Guard becomes a momentous historical occasion. Western viewers of an official film of the event shown in Hong Kong and elsewhere were so impressed with the intensity of mass emotion and primal unity evoked that they have compared it to the triumph of the will, the Nazis' famous film of Hitler at Nuremberg. One of these observers, Franz Skurman, 
noting the extraordinary dawn scene of a million people gathered in the great square singing Dong Fang Hong, the East is Red. Mao Zedong powerful in his presence, though walking slowly and stiffly, and thereby encouraging rumors of severe illness, then moving out among the masses on the arm of a teenage girl, went further and spoke of the formation of a new community. I would suggest that this new community, in a symbolic sense, is a community of immortals, of men, women, and children, entering into a new relationship with the eternal revolutionary process. An event of this kind is meant to convey a blending of the immortal cultural and racial substance of the Chinese as a people with the equally immortal communist revolution. On other occasions as well, the Red Guard could convey an image of young people touched by grace, bestowing their anointed state upon everyone around them. A Chinese-speaking Westerner who moved freely among thousands of Red Guards during a visit to Canton, Guangzhou, in January 1967, described to me an extraordinary scene of children of 13 to 18 with beautiful faces, enjoying themselves enormously and looking exhilarated as they chanted, sang, and exhorted one another with the sayings of Mao Zedong, all against a backdrop of innumerable pictures of their great leader. While there were a few older supervisors among them, the general image created was not unlike that of a children's crusade. They were a mass of youngsters, unified by a transcendent vision, so infused with a sense of virtue as to be almost beatific, politicized flower children of the Cultural Revolution. But the Red Guards, as everyone knows, have also had another face. Theirs has been the task of inducing the catastrophe, of, in their own words, breaking and smashing, or initiating widespread agitation and disruption while spreading the message that this was what the country required. They became a strange young band of wandering zealots in search of evil and impurity. And during the first year of their existence, virtually nothing, and no one in China, escaped their verbal or physical abuse, including at moments even Mao Zedong, in whose name all of their actions were carried out, repeatedly identifying themselves as anti-bureaucratic and anti-authority. The Red Guard became the means by which the Maoists undermined the very party and state structure they had so painfully labored to create over the entire course of the Chinese Revolution. The Red Guard's symbolic mission was to kill virtually everything in order to clear the path for rash national rebirth, leaving only Mao and his thought as the stuff of that rebirth. Hence the wide range and often remarkable targets of Red Guard activism, especially during the summer and autumn of 1966. The invasion of homes, mainly, but by no means exclusively, those of people in the five black categories with confiscation of furniture and other possessions, the humiliation of inhabitants by verbal and sometimes physical abuse, including the ritual of parading them through the streets in dunce caps, the attacks upon temples and churches and the destruction of religious art objects, as well as a certain amount of traditional and contemporary Western-influenced art, the cutting of hair and removing of leather shoes of Hong Kong visitors, removal from shop windows of clothes considered to be of queer and alien fashion, even when Chinese made, and the destruction of foreign-made objects of all kinds, including dolls and playing cards, the replacement of usual burial ceremonies with simple cremation, and the demand that traffic signals be reversed so that red have the properly positive connotation of go, that the order in military drill be changed from eyes right to eyes left, and that Beijing itself be renamed Dong Fang Hong, or the East is Red. To be sure, these latter demands probably resulted in nothing more than colorful great character posters, and much else in the Red Guard Crusade turned out to be rather short-lived and even improvisational. Yet the Crusade had an overall consistency of spirit that was well expressed in the manifesto of one group of middle school students. Quote, we are the Red Guards of Chairman Mao, and we affect the convulsion. We tear up and smash up old calendars, precious vases, 
U.S. and British records, superstitious lacquers and ancient paintings, and we put up the picture of Chairman Mao. All of this is seen as part of the prin general principle of breaking down the old and establishing the new. But since only revolutionary Maoism is eligible to be designated as new, everything else, especially that which feels un-Chinese, non-revolutionary, or simply non-Maoist, must be destroyed as old. The Red Guard was to embody and to demonstrate to all a principle of renewal and an image of perpetual youth, really perpetual life, that was both revolutionary and Chinese. Whether or not accompanied by physical abuse, the verbal violence of the crusade was impressive. The literature associated with the Red Guards has abounded in gory death imagery. It has sometimes taken the form of a kind of military bravado, quote, demolition bombs and hand grenades will be thrown. Let what is called human affection get out of the way. And at other times, it has called forth various biological and anatomical metaphors. Quote, non-revolutionaries are bad eggs. Counter-revolutionaries are broken eggs. They must dig out their guts, change their bones. Unquote. Peasant earthiness merges with extreme expressions of class antagonism. Quote, Old and young gentlemen of landlord and bourgeois classes, we tell you frankly, you all stink. You are nothing special, just rotten trash. We detest you from our hearts. We hate you. We shall beat members of these exploiting classes. We shall crunch them. We shall smite their dog mouths, and our bayonets shall taste blood. Unquote. There must be no leniency, no reconciliation. Quote, we want to settle accounts for every drop of this ocean of blood-stained hatred. Nothing will ever be forgotten. Unquote. And those victimized are accused of being vampires and made to ring death bells. In this way, alleged evil is linked with death. The enemy is defined as whoever de denies or is opposed to the proletarian Maoist line of our party, followed by the simple statement, he will die and we will live. Beyond the simple threat, we encounter in this last expression a fundamental psychological impetus for victimization, or what is more gently called prejudice. The need to reassert one's own immortality, or that of one's group, by contrasting it with its absolute absence in one's death-tainted victim. Footnote. The language used is sometimes reminiscent of the Old Testament, and sometimes of 19th century Chinese anti-missionary and anti-Christian outbursts, though of course often more excessive than either. For this kind of extreme language, demonic, scatological, violent, hysterical, is likely to be called forth in struggles between contending modes of immortality. The process is further intensified by youthful zeal and peasant superstitiousness. Told and retold during the same period have been stories of heroism, of martyrs who gave their lives to combat military, industrial, cultural, or even natural enemies. The individual Red Guard was to model himself upon them and become the most recent and by far the most ambitious version of the new man in the socialist era. Footnote. This new man is also expected to embody what Maurice Meisner calls the original bourgeois virtues, diligence, frugality, self-discipline, honesty, belief in the moral value of work, and unselfishness. Meisner views these as part of, quote, an ascetic pattern of life demanded by Chinese communist ideology as a means by which men can transform themselves and transform nature to realize the truly human life that, in Marxist theory, is historically located in the socialist utopia of the future, unquote. What I am suggesting is that this ascetic ideal, much like the Calvinist equivalent Meisner also mentions, is bound up with a transcendent involvement. While the Calvinists sought to establish the kingdom of God on earth, the Maoists seek a kingdom of eternal revolution. The privileged status of the Red Guards was in the service of the most privileged of missions. Quote, we are graduating students, the generation that counts in the Chinese and in the world revolution. The Red Guard was, in fact, to epitomize the unlimited capacity of the community of immortals.
One young man expressed this to me vividly when talking about his former Red Guard comrades, quote, they thought themselves the greatest people in the world. They felt they could do anything.